The average Australian garage is 3.4 metres by 5.8 metres, which sounds great and big, except when you have to share it with the car, the boat, the kids, and anything else you can put in there. How are you supposed to get anything done? Well, welcome to the tiny workshop. My name is John Madden. I'm afraid I'm here all by myself this evening because, um, well, Patrick's not here, obviously. We've had a death in the Timbercon family. Very sadly, uh, Patrick's dog Whittaker passed last week. So um, Patrick's taken a bit of time out to um, work through that. So Patrick, if you're out there watching the show, um, we all send our love to you and to Whitaker. And so um, everyone stay tuned tonight um, because later in the show we're going to have a little tribute to Whitaker for those who have met him over the years. Um, while we're here, we'll just mention that uh, remember to subscribe to the program and click the bell to, so you get updates of when we release um, new videos. Now, you're all probably starting to panic thinking that you're going to have to put up with me for the whole evening, but Haig insisted we go forward with tonight's show, and so we looked around um, for a suitable substitute, and um, we actually couldn't find anyone, so um, we settled on Jeff. Jeff, please, come on the show, Jeffrey. <laughs> Jeffrey yeah. Dubay. Jeffrey, is it Dubay? Or? It's actually Dobe. Dobe. Jeff Dobe. Yeah, Do you have a middle name? Dubay is nice. No, I don't. No middle name. Jeff Dobe. Yeah, so my parents um, didn't give me one. So I've often thought, what could I choose? John? John Dobe. It's not. Um, Jeff No, Dobe. Jeff. Jeff John Dobe. I think we'll stick with Mr. Dubay or Jeffrey okay. Dubay. Jeff Actually, Dubay. Jeff works for Timbercon. Yeah. Some of you people out there have probably seen um, Jeff on some videos. Yeah, couple. and um, he does work in the showroom here. So some of you may have seen Jeff there as you may have. well. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you might have talked to me on the phone. Phone. Yeah, we had a lot you of phone calls here. Yeah. Asked me questions about products. Yeah. Yeah, I'm the Kiwi, so. so. <laughs> well, we we were we, we were discussing whether we're actually allowed to make fun of that or not, and you were kind of pretty sensitive about it. I mean, you know, there's a threshold. There's a threshold. There really is. There's, you know, 20, 30,000 times a day, that's okay. Anything more than that, you know, it's a bit. What the hell is a chilli bun? How it's a it bin. Get we get what it chili. is. Chilli. What's is an esky? Flops? Jandals. 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 Who calls them flip flops? Is that the English uh, people? Uh, probably. Anyway, anyway, Jeff, what we were doing. We are making this stool. Yes. Now this is made out of um, a real timber, probably something you don't find in New Zealand no. particularly. Though no. you've got cowrie though, and I've used yes. cowrie in the past. Yep. Are you, are you, are you still allowed to, to log that or not? No, you can reclaim it from yeah. under the ground. And like sort of, you and, you know? Yeah, I think you, if you can remove it under permit, if it's in a yeah. certainly protected species, yeah. Lovely yeah. timber. Yeah. Um, and this stool is made for Derek Lark. Hey, Derek, you're probably watching. Now, Derek has a bad back and apparently he's old. So he has problems putting on his shoes. So we right. made him a stool. And we're not 100% sure whether he puts his foot on the stool to... <coughs> Put it, do his shoelaces, right? Or does he sit on the or stool? Or does he sit to do his shoelaces? Yeah. But either way, Patrick and I managed to put that together. Yep. Now, normally, what we do on the show, as lots of you would know, is that we kind of do ninety percent of the work. Actually, we shouldn't say that, but we do a lot of the work out of hours, and right. then we kind of magically pull these things together within the you know thirty. I think we built a house once in like five and a half minutes, but I did. Um, Tonight, what we thought, we were looking at this earlier, mm. and tonight what we're going to do is we're going to focus on a lot of the little finer techniques on how to deal with end grain. Yeah? Are you familiar with end grain? I'm familiar with end grain. What sort of woodworking do you do? 
I make guitars. Oh. I make guitars. Yeah. Are they called do guitars or do? Do guitars, yeah, actually. Do guitars, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, so it's the only thing I know how to make, actually. So I'm going to learn as much as a lot of other people really? here from John, from I'm, John the master here. So I would imagine but, that uh, you, if you're a guitar maker, you actually do a lot of work using fine tools, yeah? Yeah, and there's a little bit of end grain work uh, at the neck joint. Obviously, mm. the end of the neck is a lot of end grain exposed there. So, mm. Mm. Um, yeah, I am a little bit familiar with the, the difficulties that come with trying to do joinery with end grain, yeah. Well, for those who don't do a lot of end grain, um, if we can get a close-up on this, Shelton, one of the, there's a few tasks we've got to do. We've got to trim this end grain here. Now, this end grain is protruding about half a mil to one mil. This part here is probably a mil and a half above the surface. And we're going to cut across that grain. And we're going to show a bunch of different techniques that you can do, use to achieve a nice... I've already done one there, so you can see how that's come up kind of nice and flat. We're going to talk about how to deal with this edge detail a bit. I've belt sanded that a little mm. bit earlier, which is a legitimate way to finish mm. something, I think. Um, but maybe something a little bit finer. And yep. we're also going to deal with these really, really sharp edges. How are we going to break those edges? I mean, people will say, yep. oh, why don't you just run a round over bit over that? Mm. But once you start getting inside these little negative spaces like that... Yeah, um, you can't get a route. You can't <coughs> base get a up in, there. in there. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to do all of that tonight. So you don't, you don't want to miss out. So hang around for the rest of the show. So what I think we'll do yes. is we're going to put... We need a vice. That's we do. a little bigger. We have this rather lovely bench crafted moxen vise that, um, where are you off to? Okay, that's I was going to get some clamps to stick it onto the. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. just pass me that clamp there, please. This right. enormous. This enormous. Oh! Yes, <laughs> as some of you may have seen, we um, Timbercon released pony clamps um, last week. Both locations, we had, it's, it's going really well, great product. And I've actually been wondering mm. on how to, um, what you would use such a large F clamp for. And it sort of came to me that we can use it to hold down this bench crafted box advice. Now, yeah. I want you to hang on to that. Well, we'll just turn it around while I do hang this. this. So I'm, I'm uh, about six foot seven. So that gives you an idea. Uh, how big <laughs> this one is. What, what would you use? I'm thinking like boat building. Maybe you would use this for building a boat or some sort of enormous, enormous uh, thing. I don't, I don't know. Like, I, well, I can't get past a, um, a, a Monty <coughs> Python scene starring, oh, right. like, I don't know, uh, the clamper. Charging down the, yeah. The clamper from the village. Yeah. So, Where do you want right. me to put this now, by the oh, way? Oh, you don't need to hang on to that oh, anymore. Right, okay. I just thought, so, so I thought it would be no, so. kind of amusing, but maybe not. Need the... This uh, Mox and Vice has a, a little lip on the back of it, so we can just clamp it straight off to the end of the bench. And uh, we can open it up. If you want us, Timbercon sell Benchcraft, probably the Australian distributor, if you want to know how to build this, we have a video on our YouTube channel and there's various plans and stuff available from the Benchcrafted website. So the and nice... Uh, this is cool because I was just going to say it's got cork on the side you probably can't see. Yeah. But it's kind of nice kind of cork lining there, so... It's nice and it also kind of it means that we can... Uh, let's start with an easy one, yeah. What's nice about these... Uh... Oh, hang on. You're right is that you can drop the leg right through the vise, crank it up a bit, and you've got a really, really solid fix to work on this. And it's a nice height too, yeah? So, for you. Well, for me, is that a bit... Do you want to get I'd me? have a shorter bench myself, but that's... Really? You know. a liar. Or All right. taller shoes. We have some end grain here. How are we going to deal with that? Right. Do you want to go first, or shall I go first? Uh, you go first. Well... You could either use an abrasive. Ah, good point. So, or pass me the uh, the uh, belt sand. Look at this, this thing. This is this a is antique. Well, yeah, I've owned this belt sander 
for about 20 years. Actually, she's probably longer than that now. And if you, you can develop a fair amount of skill using a bench, like using a belt sander. This is the full four inch version. Um, and so in a sense, you could actually, we won't do it because it's pretty crazy. You could actually turn this on and just belt sand that flat. You want to keep it along the grain of, of the side grain yeah. here, don't you? Well, that's right. The grain on this top, I don't know if you can see from this camera angle, is running this way. So what I would use do if I was using a belt sander was just basically drop it on there and then feather it out. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then on the same on the side, you can knock that little high point off and then just feather it out on all those sides. We won't do it because it's really loud. Also, you can turn it around like so. And you sort of, after a bit of practice, you can get the knack and you can actually run it around that edge, particularly if you just want to flatten and get any real deep scarring or cuts out of it. It's really yeah. effective. But it know? does take skill. Like, it's not just sticking it on the surface and rubbing it around. <clears throat> it does take some finesse. It does. It, it looks, it looks you know, clumsy, but it's actually, yeah. once you practice it, you can actually get a quite a good result. This is quite a coarse belt on there. But with a bit of practice, you can get a really good result. Um, yeah. I think in the 90s I did about 7,000 hours of belt sanding because we just right. round tabletops and stuff. Anyway, don't use an orbital though. Even a good quality orbital like this slightly beat up Festool, with end grain like this, you're not going to be able to cut that by sanding it with this tool. It'll just round it off, you know, so because it doesn't, you need to cut it. You can't sand off end grain. So yep. this is a big no-no. Though you can, once you've cut back your edge detail, use the sander to sand off the edge and also to relieve that corner. Yeah? Do you use, yep. do you use orbitals in your guitar, mate? I don't actually, but I, I'm thinking that I might because I'm getting a sore shoulder from hand like, sanding. Like so. one of these things? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, well, here's another option. You could do that. Well, you could... You could... And we'll be back you, next week when yeah, we'll John's still rubbing week. on the... Uh, yeah. But, um, again, maybe for finishing, but not for cutting down end grain. Yeah. Personally, I would go for a uh, chisel. All right. I spent some time sharpening my chisel this afternoon because uh, there was a lot of pressure. So if you come up in here, Shelton, pick up the... This is a little bit tricky from this angle. We can probably start from here. This one's quite high, so you don't want to try to take it all at once. What you can do is to pare that off. Yep, so when you're cutting in grain with a blade, rather than abrading it, you are cutting sideways. So the force that's required is actually quite a lot more than, you know, as you're probably familiar with. Um, the tool needs to be and you need to play around with bevel angles as well. Um, what different timbers. What do you use on yours? For, for, for pairing, just 25 degrees. 25, that's quite low, yeah? It is pretty low. I think that for this timber, using a 25 degree bevel on a hardwood like this actually might be a little low. A little I think you'd, fold, you'd fold it edge. over, yeah. I yeah. use a 30 as a standard. And... Uh, on the machine for you. So you can see how much force he's putting into that just to cut through the fibre well, sideways. Using gut power. Yes. Yeah. Really. The power of gut. Lifting the whole bench, yeah. And what I'm actually doing is using the flat of the surface to right. pair and keep my chisel flat. And I'm not trying to take too much at a time. This is not the ideal location working from here. I should turn it around. But using a chisel like this, sharpened, I think I touched this up with 10,000 grit stone. Um, it's actually quite capable of cutting the sand grain. Yeah, it's done a really nice job there. What's that little doobie you've got there? This little thing here. Hmm. It's going to do the same thing. This is a pattern maker's gouge. <coughs> so, got a crank handle. So when we were talking, <coughs> talking about different ways of doing this, um, one of the things that the chisel's not going to be able to do is it's not going to be able to register the surface if you want to come in from the back side of the raised part here because um, obviously the handle's in the way. So if you wanted to do that, if you found that the grain was playing up or whatever, um, you could do it this way and you'd actually have your hand clear. Uh, I'm not sure if this is sharp enough even to attempt it at this point, but there's something I keep around for carving braces and softwood, so 
Um, Looks like it's something you could carry to a street fight too, yeah? Yeah, um, I give it to my daughters occasionally if they're on public transport. Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, you would just be coming in similar thing. Oh gosh, it is hard, isn't it? Yeah, it's like hard this. timber. Oh my golly. And that would just allows you to get in that side with your hand away from the surface. So again, I'll be here next week still doing that. Yeah, I think the little coming into the job using the using this chisel might be. What about mm. this little block plane you've got there? That's cute. That's my little apron plane. I, mean, I think that's for finishing off though. It's not going to take this much material. That's this little baby here. Um, that's really handy for <laughs> guitar building type tasks. Mm. Um, doesn't have an adjustable mouth, so it's only ever going to take little shavings off. Once you've got it to that point though, you might find that uh, a plane that size won't uh, skip over. It'll, it'll actually get in there and flatten off those edges mm. as opposed to a longer plane, which you might not find that this is flat enough for a, for a plane to, to finish that job off. So that's kind of handy to have around. And then you've got that one, cabinet, cabinet scraper. Again, finishing off on, on end grain, kind of good. And it actually burnishes off, I don't know if you can see that, but ends up kind of burnishing the, um, the end grain. And I like that personally because, so what I'm doing there is I'm just pushing my thumbs into the back and flexing it a bit, stiffening it up and means that you, the kind of the edge that's cutting is, um, is a bit of a con, convex, so there's no corners digging in. But now that's quite a different colour to what it was before mm. because that's kind of scraped over the, some of the fibres and folded them I think. Mm. So that won't take the finish in the same way that the sliced Fibre as well, so you might find that that gives you a better look. Man, look at them go! I'll just finish this one up. Yeah. So we can illustrate the. We can get that hand plane on there. Don't gouge it, can you? This is like the hardest timber. What is it? Is red gum? It is red gum. Yeah. yeah. I'm just going to change position so I can get at this a bit better. I couldn't believe how hard Australian timbers were when I moved here. I was kind of a new woodworker anyway, and. Um, you know, so I bought some and I, I just went to Bunnings and bought some hardwood, you know. Sorry, hello again. And, um... Is that a bad camera angle, Sheldon? It probably shows off your, yeah. your biceps. Well, that, yeah. Anyway, I took this timber home and, um... Had to suddenly sharpen up all my tools and get better tools because stuff I'd been using in New Zealand uh, would cut the New Zealand timbers because there's a lot of softwoods and stuff there. Um, Cody obviously is softwood, Totara, Rimu, that kind of stuff. Uh, nothing like this. Nothing this aggressively hard. Man. Alright, so we've knocked that right back. Yep. And then once we've got that, we can move up to a block plane. So you're holding that at quite a skew. Yeah, that's exactly right. So when you're doing end grain like this with a block plane, you want to approach the cut on a slight angle. Don't go hard on, you can, sometimes you need to, because of, you know, the confines when you're working. If you approach that on a slight angle, it shears the cut. A bit like those thicknesses we sell. Yep. A little bit of patience. We can get a reasonable finish on the end grain. Yeah? So the blade angle, the bevel angle on the blade on this one is the standard 25 degrees. Yeah, 25 degrees. Yeah. Plus the bed angle of whatever it is, 12, 12, 12, 12 or degrees or something like that. So there's a few approaches on how to deal with end grain, like in this situation. Let's yep. talk about cutting off this edge now. Yeah. How would you approach that? Um, I would do it as the mood takes me. I don't think I've got a fixed, a fixed method for that. Yeah, okay. Uh, it depends on how I'm feeling at the time. Do you prefer some sort of special music or...? Yeah, I like to put on some uh, Jamaican reggae and, uh, okay. you know, break, break the edge uh, mm. in that sense. No, um, no other uh, uh, <clears throat> accessories required in that sense, but uh, it's a very meditative process, so I think you should... Breaking the edge. Take your time. Okay. Uh, get some good lighting sideways is my advice too. I'm so in the vibe. So I'm going to use a, right, so a 
folks show. This is a H&T Gordon Timucon. These are my personal tools. We sell the Lubin brand, um, yep. which will do exactly the same thing, I guess. Yeah, man, do it, man. Sorry, that's Jamaican. No accents, remember? So you just want to run it along that using the... You can hear that thunder. Think about these um, tools. It's really a matter of finding the sweet spot rather than just sort of, oh, you know, saying it doesn't work. When you, you can hear it there, yeah. starting to cut. And you've got your, I notice you've got your eyeballs right on the tool. Yeah. You're not just kind of randomly rubbing away, but you are looking at the progress of the cut as you're going. You are, and you're also like counting them. Say, I didn't count those because I'm distracted, but like, say I'm going to use, do X number of cuts, two, three, four, five, little hard spot there, six. You just relieve that edge, little chamfer on there now. Six cuts either side and off you go. Yeah, and you can choose when to stop. If you use a chamfer bit, um, a mechanical, you know, tool is a completely valid way, but it's going to give you a preset size. Yeah. So you need to decide that up front. Mm. With, a, with the hand tool, you can just kind of take a stroke and think, is that enough? Go with the flow. Right. What's, the, what's the Jamaican? Listen to the doing, reggae yeah. music. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, you use files, yeah? I use files, um, and I got told off for that today because oh, okay. apparently files aren't woodworking tools, but I find them really great. I Last think they're forever. woodworking tools. You need a good file. They're, they're cheap. They're, if you only use them on wood, so I have files that I use on metal, and then I have files that I never use on metal just because I know that it'll, you know, they'll go blunt quickly. And I always have files that are round, like half round mm. ones. The reason for that is just that I actually use them for um, the round over on the edge of the binding on the guitar. Yeah, okay. which goes around the two bouts, but then there's also a waste area, which is why that's really good. So that is just, well, I'm a bit short for, for this arrangement, but it's literally just a matter of getting the file in on an angle and stroking it down this way. And it takes a little while, but you can see it sort of relieve. And I'm, I'm actually aim, aiming for a rounded profile rather than a, a nice straight chamfer like, like John's done. Yeah. So... Starting with, the, starting with the file up here. I've been mean, watching a lot of The Handmaid's Tale, so it's all, you know, I'm living in a totalitarian state at the moment, so I want straight. Yeah, and so what I do is I look at the way that the light is striking that, that edge. When you've got a sharp edge, obviously you're getting a sharp line between the top surface and the side surface, and you can see that sharp line. As you, as you shape the edge, that shadow changes in nature and when you've got a nice curve that's straight along the along the edge you'll see that there's a, a straight gradient mm -hmm. um, so you can visually tell where you need to go next um, and it doesn't take very long you get a round over and the finish that comes off a file is pretty good like you don't need a lot of sanding after that if i feel like i need to touch it up i go for a finer file basically like sandpaper the files come in different grades they do course through to fine so you can approach the finishing in the same way. Yep. Let's look at the dealing with the underside of the leg. Oh. I wasn't looking forward to this part. Where Just open that up a bit, will you? Mox and Vice, really? Both, oh, we go, oh, we go, oh, we go. A little bit more. A bit more? There we go. Yeah. I love the Moxon. It's very, good. If you're making things that are unusual shapes, the Moxon is very handy. There we go. This is when I use a file a lot. I mean, We've got a bit more work to do, obviously, oh, that'll be right. yeah. on this piece to get it finished, but using a file to clean up, like add a little chamfer to the back of the foot, because if you don't hold the file, pinch the end, and then to add a little chamfer on that leg, because if you don't take that sharpness out, it's going to tear your floor coverings, or it can pull and tear a chip of timber off the piece. So, Files are really handy for that kind of process as well. Yep. And um, you can even sort of be a bit cheeky and sort of turn like so. And different to, a, different to a rasp as well. So a rasp won't do that job for you. Rasp is too coarse. Yep. It's more for shaping where this is just for detailing, yeah? Yep. Okay, so, <laughs> so... This one here as well. It's wedged in there. There you go. Now where are you going? Let's put that in the middle now, like yep. so. Just drop that down. Oh, 
I do it. And so, once you've got all these little details done, the edge work, we're running out of time, so we won't go through the edge shaping you because you can use a uh, spoke shave to deal with edges as well. You have to watch the grain direction when you're doing this though. You have to be you going do. downhill on the grain. Yeah, this and this is end grain. You don't want to be coming this way. No. You can actually come around, uh, finding that cutting edge. It's yep. been a while since I've done this. So, I like these, uh, these tools you've got, John. They're beautiful, aren't they? Oh, well, in the day. Mm. Um, if you can get a really fine tool to cut the end grain like that around edges, that's going to save you three to four years of your life in sanding because you can get a nice <laughs> resolved edge almost yeah. um, without a lot of effort. And can I just say too, it'll save three to four years of your life in lung cancer as well because sanding dust. makes dust and no matter how good your dust extraction is, you'll find it around the place. An edge tool or even a coarse file like that produces bigger dust, yeah. can't breathe that in so easily. And there's a certain level of pleasure when it comes to hand tools. And appreciating a lot of people out there don't really use them and they prefer powered stuff is that the key benefit though for me is that I, I guess it's a sense of control that you can train yourself and you, there's an empowerment about using hand tools and you won't miss a moment of the cricket when you're woodworking in your shed or music, Jamaica, Bob Marley, yep. whatever you're into. Um, once you get that end grade dealt with, then you can really get into your sand. Obviously, you don't use that like that, but you know, turn it on and all, all yep. it away. And what we're going to do is, no one wants to see us standing here sanding with an orbital. I really? mean, some people might, but we're not going to do it. There's a niche market for that, I think. Very niche market yeah, for that. Not... In the paint drying market. Yeah? <laughs> we're going to take a short break where Jeffrey's going to talk about oil finishes. After the break, we're going to talk a little bit about the process of how we're going to approach finishing this table, and then we're going to talk about our next project. So uh, stick around, we'll see you after the break. Hello, and welcome to another Tiny Workshop Tiny Tips segment. My name's Jeff, and today we're talking about oils. The Australian guys here have asked me to remind you that oils ain't oils. I'm not sure what that reference is from. They laugh every time I say it. So we're talking about finishing oils today. Finishing oils are drying oils. They are oils that uh, re react to the oxygen in the air to form a dry film um, at room temperature. So that's obviously why we use them as, as finishes. We sell three main kinds here at Timbercon. We sell a raw tongue oil. That is just a unrefined vegetable oil that will dry on the surface of your project. Doesn't give you a heck of a lot of protection, gives you a lot of beautiful look to the project, um, and it's natural, it's all natural, it doesn't have any yucky stuff in there. Over time, people decided, well, let's improve the performance of just, you know, oil that's been squeezed out of a bit of plant, and they fiddled around with it. So next in the kind of evolutionary progression of oil finishes, we have the, what we call the Danish oil, or sometimes called Scandinavian oil. And there's different formulations of this. The basic idea is that it's an oil like a tongue oil or a linseed oil with a varnish component added to it and a thinner, a thinner component to make it easy to apply. It behaves just the same as tongue oil in terms of the application. You wipe it on with a rag, you wipe it off again. Um, gives you a little bit more protection though because of the varnish component. Um, and the thinners and the oil component help the finish to soak right into the timber and give you a deep a deeper kind of finish. You don't get a build like you do with a straight varnish, um, so you still get that lovely kind of oil look. Uh, and the third category of finish, oil finish that we sell here at Timcon is called a hard wax oil. These are pretty new um, in the history of finishes, um, and they're quite interesting products because they are a natural oil with a very, very finely powdered wax component in them, hence the name hard wax oil. Now, when you're applying hard wax oils, they do behave a little bit differently to a straight oil or a Danish oil type product. They sort of need to be buffed in, and that's that wax component needs to be sort of rubbed, um, buffed, heated up or something that happens when you're rubbing it in um, that sort of smooths out that surface and gives you the finish. 
you will find with the hard wax oil that it looks a little bit more modern um, is the best way to put it. It doesn't give you that kind of deep uh, colour pop that sometimes you get or that you, you, you get often with, um, with a natural oil. It's sort of more of a lighter um, colour that doesn't quite give you that depth. So if you're looking for an old time kind of antique look, you want to go with a more old fashioned natural oil or a Danish oil. If you're looking for something a bit more modern, a bit more sort of Scandinavian furniture looking, um, hard wax oil is definitely the way to go. So because you do get slightly different look and performance from each of the finishes, the best thing to do as always is to find a bit of scrap wood that matches the project, uh, give it a test, try different application techniques, let it dry off, think about it, are you getting the look that you want? Uh, and only when you've decided that you are, um, should you really commit to a particular product. So my name's Jeff. that was another two minute tiny tip. Back to the tiny workshop. The nest. Yeah. What sort of bird does that? Um, oh. Some kiwi one. <laughs> Hello, welcome back to the um, tiny workshop. Um, my name's John Madden. We've got Jeff Dubay here tonight, replacing Patrick, who's on unscheduled leave um, for personal reasons. So the first part of the show, we went through like some you know detailing techniques on using hand tools. Um, now we're going to talk about oil finishes. Now Jeff just did a whole spiel on it. We're going to kind of I go did. through it again a little bit, a little but bit. more about how to apply oil. Yes. Right. So what's your oil of choice, personally? My oil of mm. choice uh, is actually um, very cheap linseed oil. Yeah, okay. Yeah, because it's very cheap. But uh, it's pretty similar to tongue oil in the sense that it's a raw plant oil. Do you use that oil. on your guitars? Not really, no. No, okay. No, no that's but more... tool handles, shellac jigs and stuff. Yeah, I've, yeah, yeah, use shellac, okay. yeah. Which is a totally different class of finish. Um, but the cool thing about oil is it's really forgiving, right? You can just... Mm. sort of splatter it on and as long as you don't leave, leave big puddles and everywhere it, it goes off it's fine and it's know. got a really strong advantage I mean when, I remember when I used to make furniture people come and say oh yeah but I want to I want a lacquered table I want lacquer on my table because mm. lacquer is going to stop it getting rings and it's going to protect the wood what right. is your four-year-old going to go to the table with a knife like, ah, ah, ah. no it doesn't happen like that doesn't no, it My does yeah, anyway. depends on your yeah, kids. Because yeah. I've met your children yeah, actually. Yeah. We went to the cricket, and one, I had my ear chewed off by your boy. How was his boy? Oh, your boy. Yes. I've, got, I've got girls. Girls, sorry, I'm an idiot. You know this already. No. Um, the thing, the truth about oil finishes is that if you have a lacquer table and you scratch it, you've got to repair the whole finish. You can't independent. You can burnish it a little bit using yeah. wax, no doubt about that. But if you damage an oil table, you can repair it. That's because the finish right. is in the surface, not on the surface. And, and the refinishing just blends into yeah. a film finish. If you try and re repair it, you need to somehow disguise those witness lines that are between the, the old finish and the new finish. Witness lines. Witness like lines, that, yeah. yeah. It's Great a real pain. Too. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, yes, that's right. I mean, my daughters would chew your ear off, but... Oh, for a different reason altogether. Depends on the mood yeah, though, yeah. yeah. Two different types of warfare. Yep. Now, applying oil, um, you can use a rag. Yes. That's not really a rag, but that's what we have available. You can use brushes, which brushes. are rather nice. Yeah. Um, and your hands right. don't get all dirty. They do. Particularly tongue oil, because it's quite sticky. If the finish may have a little bit of polyurethane or varnish in it, yep. you don't want to get that on your skin because it's not pleasant. You do need to clean the brushes afterwards, though, which can be a bit of a... Yeah, yeah. but if you buy these ones, you use them, you throw them away, you True. know what I mean? Which is terrible, but hey, it's very job. convenient. Yeah. Okay. Um, and personally, I always like to put my first coat of oil on using a rag. Do you sand between your coats? Uh, yes, if stuff gets stuck in there, I will give it a bit of a... You know, like what sort if, of stuff gets well, like stuck? Dust and crap and flies and, I don't know, Australian wombats... Square poo, apparently. Yeah. Um, this is another really great advantage of oil finishing is that oil finishers don't really mind during the creation of the finish to get a bit of dust on them. So if you're working in a tiny workshop like ours... Yeah, you're going to get... Um, yeah. So even though, say I oiled this and then accidentally, I don't know, some fairies came by and dropped some dust all over it, I don't know, and in the morning you've got to dust it off, it doesn't matter because... You can just simply do a really light sand with a higher grit, yeah, 300 take grit, much. Yeah. 400 grit, and just re-oil it. So 
Yep. Really key advantage using an oil finish is that you can make things and finish things in the same space. If you try to do that with some sort of spray on lacquer, particularly some of that crap they sell down at the hardware stores, mm. you're going to have dramas because the dust will settle on there and it'll become blemished and unpleasant. So I think the other time that I would sand is when I've put, put oil on there and it reveals some scratches or mm. sanding marks that I didn't see before when it was, the, mm. oil, um, the oil was soaked into those broken grains and you'll think, heck, so you have to go and refinish that area. And that's no problem with an oil finish. You just... You just sand it again mm. and reapply it, and it blends back into the parts that you didn't sand. Mm, good so, point. Preempting yeah. little sort of fine. I used to make a piece that was like a love heart thing. It was a cool piece. Mm. Very hard to get the end grain right and very fine scratches. So I used to wash it with some methylated spirits, and you could pick up any yeah, defects in your sanding. Stuff there. Yeah. Um, also, I personally, once I've got the first coat of oil on, no matter what type it is, I will use 4.0 still wool as a burnisher to do my, you know, the next three to four coats. Do you ever use that technique? I don't because I don't like the way it sort of crumbles up and breaks, yeah. breaks up. And, no, well, yeah, it's got to be old yeah. to do that. No, yeah. the, I use it for a The long. reason I do it is that because, again, when oil is applied to timber, it sucks into the timber, uh, you know, it, it sits below the surface. So if you use... The 4.0 steel wool, it's actually polishing and burnishing the surface of the timber in the same process. So you can pop up a finish quicker, like oil finishes take... Ooh, and you've, or, yeah. you could use one of these and it won't break up. Yeah. The scotch Brite pad, they come in different, you know, grit. It's mm. a nylon cloth with abrasive in it. Mm. Same technique, but... Mm you avoid the breaking up thing. I don't know, why, why does my steel wool break up? Or maybe maybe just... you're just too vigorous, I don't know. Yeah, you know you've got very strong wrists. Um, and also, once you've finished it, I find that for get a really good pop, like when it goes, huh, mm. I'm saturated, I'm full, I'm ready to shine, it can take at least, what, four coats of oil? Depending on the uh, product. Yeah? And the the first one's always the most dramatic. And then, well, it just and then gets after, that, in, yeah. after that, you're building, yeah. Well, it is dramatic, yeah. but you mm. don't get that sheen. No. I like to let it dry and then use like a, a some sort of uh, beeswax. Again, using sparingly, um, sparingly rub beeswax. Let it dry and then buff it. Yeah. You know? So beeswax does give you a film on the top. Very thin. But though. it's very, very thin and it doesn't stick around. It doesn't cure. It doesn't mm. harden in any kind of a way. Mm. But it's lovely. Mm, it and, smells nice. Yeah, and, and you can reapply it just before oh. grandma comes over or whatever, yeah, just to yeah. give everything a... Quick, I, I, it's know. a great quote, though. Dust is a, the perfect finish for well-made furniture or something. Okay, well, it doesn't matter. Yeah. The thing yeah. is, so you can use... Well, if you do get fine scratches from use, like old mate sits down on the chair, has his little fancy phone holder on his belt, and he scratches your bloody stool, you can use a little bit of steel wool and wax and just burnish that out and you can actually conceal things mm. very handy product the advantages of oil yep so then oil plus wax equals that hard wax oil it is but yeah that sits in the surface this is on top yeah, yeah. but this is i think the kind of modern version of that where they've tried to put wax into the product already so you don't need two separate stages um yeah, i like wax as a separate product yeah to add a Layer of sheen above. Mm. Don't use Mr. Sheen. Stick to or wax. Yeah. You don't use what's that other stuff that some horrible stuff that you buy from the supermarket for furniture. I think, as I said in the, the tiny tool, tiny tiny tips. Tiny tips. This does not give you the old-fashioned dramatic pop in the in the no. in the grain. Um, You've so you, you you use this specifically when you want to. You might be using a very um, uh, unfigured sort of like a mahogany or something you want to keep it nice and plain mm. that's perfect for that um, you're going for the like the Scandinavian look. right I like a little bit more elegant elegant yes. yeah not but a, oil you know, finishes not will bring out a natural luster they give timber furniture a really yep. I don't know it's a different sort of energy to a lacquer but I think we've crapped on about that yes. enough we want to talk about, we're going, next week we're going to finish that up properly. We'll probably do a tiny tip and apply that. But uh, we, we decided that you watching us oil something is probably not, not that exciting. 
Again, what, I think there's a niche market for that. Niche I market. I think we should yeah. probably explore. I went that. to WA on the weekend to oh. the Timber Tools and Techniques. I think that's the right order, is it? Yeah. Um, weekend, yeah. which was a really great success. We had a mm. great turnout. We saw lots of pony clamps. And I met Jacko Jackson from WA. Now, Jacko um, is an interesting gentleman. He loves the show. Right. Came over and he's kind of mocking me a bit, wanting an autograph. Anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Jacko claimed that he couldn't use his computer well enough to send us an email to uh, ask us to build him something. Right. Now, and he's an interesting guy. He plays rugby. He's from Wales. And he makes um, wedding cakes. This is why woodworkers are so hard to market to, man. These people are weird. Yeah. Anyway. That's... So this rugby playing Welshman who makes um, wedding cakes yeah. wants a... And we're not quite sure... Let's grab that over here. What it's called. He has two daughters. There you go. Crash. Is that in shot okay? Yeah. Oh, the shop. Here's, here's, here's the brief from Jacko. Okay, so hang on. So he's, he's, he's wandered up to you and he said yep. to you, I want you to make me something on your show. Yeah, because we made this for Derek and he wants us to make him this. So imagine this. This is a sink. Like a kitchen sink. Or a bathroom sink. Bathroom There's sink. the tap and the drain. Yep. And that's the bench. All right. And this is a kid. No, I didn't meet the children. Where's my pen? They, um, you, there's... Somewhere. Oh, that's probably... Water there. Oh, there's a eagle eyes, wow, look at that. Um, this, this kid here, when she comes up to the sink, can't actually reach the tap to clean her teeth, right? So what Jacko required was a... And we're drawing this as a, this is a design brief. Yeah. <coughs> is a is a what would you call it, Jeffrey? Like a. So she needs something to stand on, yeah. right? That's going to raise her up enough so she can reach, but not just a footstool. It's got to have like handhold things on. Jacko it. specifically wanted, for safety reasons, to have hand right. holders on either side, and so I'm not sure what her name is. Um, and stand on there to clean her teeth each evening. But there's a complication. There's a second kid. Second kid's always a complication, isn't it? <laughs> I always find. Second so. kid. And the second kid's smaller. All right, we, you can finish that drawing off. Well, I, so, I have to do it in purple. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. It's got arms and that. So this means that the thing, and we're not sure what this is called... What's, what is it? A step ladder? That's not the right word. A pedestal. A pedestal. A pedestal. It means that the thing needs to have two height positions or an adjustable shelf, which complicates the design. We can just make a bloody box here. Yeah, stand on that, as most of us would. But Jacko was very specific, and if you saw his wedding case, you'd understand why. This is our next project. I will give a $50, or TimberCon will give a $50 <laughs> gift voucher to anybody who can tell us what these things are called. What is it, a step ladder? Um, uh, a dais? A dais. Is that, is that a thing? How did you get on the show? Dais? We were desperate. Yeah. Uh, or um, uh, elevatory uh, equipment. An altar? So, so, but, so you, you can't have both levels on the thing at the same time. One has to come off and the next one has to go on. Well, the, sh the shelf needs to be adjustable. It right. needs to be adjustable from the near side so it's convenient to use and it needs to carry a kid and you don't want the kid to fall off and die So right. because that's a major problem. So no death. It has to be an adjustable height. Right. $50 gift voucher to anyone who can tell us what we should call this thing and we're interested in your design input as well because we have to work out how to make this thing work it's not a great drawing, but I guess you get the concept, yeah? Jeffrey. Yes. I'm not sure if you'll be on the show next week because you were so appalling tonight. But anyway, <laughs> I'm just checking, darling. Um, Patrick will probably be back with us next week. 
Um, Jeffrey, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having I me. I think we definitely will have you on again. And oh. actually, maybe I'll take a week off and go to the coast and you can come on and work with Patrick. Patrick and I. We're about the same height too, so we probably work yeah. better visually, I think. Some people thought that we just shaved Patrick for a joke, but no, this is no. a different person. Different person. Um, now, thanks for watching the program. We're back. This has been a bit unusual tonight because we're all a bit thrown with Whitaker's passing. Um, stick around, there's a, a little tribute to him coming up. Uh, remember to subscribe to the channel, press the bell, check out the tiny workshop at timbercon.com. Is that the address? What is the address? Timbercon? Tiny, tiny workshop at timbercon.com.au. If you want any information, you've got any suggestions, tiny workshop at timbercon.com.au. You can send us emails through uh, YouTube. Uh, we're interested in your feedback on the design. We'll see you next week. Uh, thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, John. Have a, um, have a lovely evening. See you next week. See you later.